Good evening. Good evening. It's more like it. Can't have you falling asleep before I've started. God, dear, dear. Right. Those of you who don't know me, my background originally uh, was property management. Blocks of flats, estates of blocks of flats. In fact, my first property management job was just up the road at King's Cross working for a little freeholder called Freshwater Property Group. Anyone heard about them? Yeah. I learned an awful lot at Freshwaters on how not to do things. Um, I, I've spent 30, actually it's probably about 35, 36 years now in property management. I started my first property management company back in 1984, running the business from the spare bedroom of my flat in Fulham. Didn't tell the landlord, I was running a business from his flat. I managed to get away with it. And I built that business up until it was managing around 10,000 units, London, M25, home counties, etc. And then I sold it to four of my staff who have been blissfully stressed ever since. I don't have anything to do with that business anymore. I have a new property management business, but most of the management I do these days is tribunal work or court appointments, re really seriously sick properties that need sorting out. Actually, generally, it's the property's okay. It's the people that need sorting out. Um, uh, that's what I do these days on the property management front. Uh, I also do property investment, um, HMOs and title splitting and stuff like that with my lovely wife who's at the back there, Lynn. So over the years, I have um, come across short leases and stuff like that um, and am now able to look at it from several sides of the fence, so to speak. So hopefully I can get some of that information across to you tonight in 30 to 45 minutes or so. Um, if you want a copy of these slides, I'm happy to give you a copy of the slides. Just email me um, tomorrow, or right now, if you want, I suppose, um, and I will send slides to you. Bernie at berniewales.co.uk. Really imaginative email address. Okay, before we start on the short lease bit. How many people here have got a leasehold flat? Either you live in it or you have an investment leasehold flat. Quite a lot of you. And how many of you have read the lease recently? Not a lot of you. And you're all laughing about it. Very good. Okay. If you take nothing else away from tonight, take this away. RTBL. It comes from when I had that company with 10,000 units or so, and I had 25, 26 staff, and there was a sort of fairly constant stream of people coming into my office and interrupting me with leasehold queries. And in the end, I got so fed up with it, I printed out RTBL, I put it up on the wall, and every time they came in, I would just point, they would go away, and nine times out of 10, they wouldn't come back because RTBL gives you the answer to 99% of leasehold problems. What does it mean? Read the bloody lease. Read the bloody lease. I'm glad you already know that, that's good. <laughs> and those of you that put your hands up saying you have got a flat and haven't read your bloody lease, then put that down as an action point tonight to, to read it and find out a little bit about it, it principally what the original term was and, and how much time is left unexpired. So remember that if you remember nothing else about what I say. So, what are we talking about here? What is a short lease? Any offers? Less than 60 years. Less than 60 years? 85? Less than 80? 70? There's a good consensus of opinion here, isn't there? Okay. Short leases actually do not exist, which is probably why there's a consensus of opinion. There are actually long leases that have been worn away by time, and there is a short or short-ish unexpired term left. In the example I've got here, 99 years from March 1990, would have about 73 years left unexpired, and that is getting into short leasehold territory. Why is it a problem? Often sellers find it's a problem. Actually, it's the estate agent who... Have I got estate agents in the room? Before I go insulting them. 
Okay, <laughs> only one. Okay. Um, estate agents normally um, spot that there is a, a short lease and they go, that's a, that's a problem, got a short lease, we're only going to be having cash buyers here, we'll have to drop the price, etc. Um, it's unmortgageable, etc. That is the main problem, it's unmortgageable. As Ranjan was saying earlier, um, it leaves you with just cash buyers. Mortgage companies are looking not, not just at the security that they've got now, but over the length of the term of that mortgage, and I'll cover that a bit later because I'll explain why they get worried about it and why they do not want to give you a mortgage. But all things are solvable, and you can approach the freeholder, like Ranjan, ask him for a lease extension, and if you give him enough money, he'll give you a lease extension. All freeholders will do what you want them to do, provided you give them enough money. They're very simple people, freeholders. <laughs> the problem is, they want too much money, and generally, leaseholders don't have that amount of money available at the time that they want the lease extension, and therefore, they put it off till next year, and then they haven't got the money next year either, and they put it off, and they put it off, and put it off, and the problem is that the problem gets bigger and bigger because the lease is getting shorter and shorter, and the cost that the freeholder wants gets bigger and bigger. So it, it's a problem, don't put it off. And those of you that haven't yet read your bloody lease, go and read it, and if you're down to 80-something years, do something about it straight away. So, this is a very simple, oversimplified graph of the relationship between a freeholder and a leaseholder in terms of value of their lease. In this example, we have a flat that was sold for £100,000 on a 99-year lease. From the leaseholder point of view, the blue line, at day one, they've just paid £100,000 for that flat. It's worth £100,000 to them. But as with any lease, uh, when you get to the end of the lease, in theory, you give that flat back to the landlord and it all starts over again. So at the end of 99 years, from a leaseholder point of view, the value is zero. So over that time, the value of that lease is going down and down from the leaseholder side of life. And that's why mortgage companies are worried about it, because yes, they're interested in the security that they're getting for the loan today, but more importantly, what's that flat going to be worth at the end of the term, 25 years' time, maybe? If the value is decreasing, you get to a point where maybe in 20 years' time, there isn't enough security there for the mortgage, and therefore, they don't give you the mortgage in the first place. Conversely, on the freeholder side of life, on day one, when he's just sold that flat, he's not going to get any more money out of that leaseholder, and that lease is worth virtually zero to the freeholder at that point. It's not exactly zero, but it's virtually so. But at the end of the 99 years, in this case, he gets a flat back, and he starts again. So over the time, the value of that lease from the freeholder point of view is rising. And so you have this relationship between the two. Leaseholder value is going down, and freeholder value is going up. And that is very important to recognize because it affects the behavior of the people involved. Okay? Now, whether you are selling a short lease flat or you are buying a short lease flat, there is certain information that you need in order to find out what the costs and the values are. It requires you to read the bloody lease and get this information. You want the original term of the lease. Normally in the lease it will say to hold the demise premises for 99 years from whatever. It could be 125 years. It could be any term, but 99 and 125 are the most common. In some cases, you get 999. And in Bristol, for some reason, you get 199. I have no idea why Bristol is different, but they like 199 over there. You also need to know what the original rent was on day one. In this example, £50. 
and how that rent changes over the period of the lease. With 99-year leases, generally, they double every 33 years. They don't all, but 50 pounds might go to 100 and then might go to 200. And on one to five year leases, they tend to change every 25 years. But every lease is different, so you do need to read them to check because that's important and you'll see why in a minute. It's also useful if you can find out what's the value of the flat now with a short lease and what's the value of the flat with an extended lease. Now you'll know the value now with the short lease because the estate agent's got it on the market at that price. And if you're selling, he's just gone, we gotta knock the price down to whatever. So you know what the short lease price is. It's a little bit more difficult to find the extended price, but you need to go out there and find your comparables. And certainly in an area like this in London where you have large mansion blocks, etc., there is a lot of evidence available. You'll find that Similar flats will have a two-tier pricing system. A one-bedroom flat in a particular block may well have a whole series of prices that are low and also a whole series of prices that are high. The low ones generally are short leases, unextended leases, and the higher ones have been extended, etc. You need to do a little bit more research to check that that is the case. One may be an entirely crappy one and you've got to spend 50 grand to make it habitable. The other one may have gold taps or something like that. So you've got to do a bit more research, but generally you'll be able to see that there is a difference between short and extended. In the example here, 200,000 200, for a short lease and 250,000 for an extended gives me a window of 50,000 pounds. If I can get a lease extension for let's say 20,000 pounds, I can make a 30,000 pound pay for profit. With me? Good. There are a few things that you need to bear in mind in this process. It is a paperwork exercise. Um, it, the paperwork in particular in this is the leaseholder's notice. You can serve a notice upon the freeholder requiring them to give you a lease extension. And I'll come back to that in more detail in a minute. There are costs involved, as with anything in life. There are costs. You will have valuation and legal costs. And if you serve a notice, you're required to pay the landlord's costs as well. Valuers and solicitors are involved. It's a specialist area of law, a specialist area of valuation. And I would always recommend that you use specialists for this rather than your high street solicitor or whatever. There are also situations where you don't necessarily qualify and you need to know what they are. We'll come back to that. And there is marriage value. It's not quite as expensive as divorce, but it's a similar sort of thing. Can cost you a lot of money. If you can avoid it, um, that's good. I'll come back to each of those one by one. So, as I said, over the years, I've been involved with this on both sides of the fence. In property management, you get leaseholders coming to you um, as the first point of call when they need a lease extension. And depending on whether I'm acting for a freeholder as my client or I'm acting uh, for a leaseholder, then I will behave differently. Let me explain what I do. Where I'm acting for a freeholder, say Ranjan uh, had got me to help on the management of his property and a, one of his leaseholders comes to me and asks for a lease extension. I will ask all of the sorts of questions that you would ask any motivated seller. How long has that flat been on the market? How many times has it fallen through? Where are you moving to? Where's the dream house? What's the school that the kids are going to? I need to know the whole picture of that situation for that leaseholder. And in particular, I need to know where the opportunities are and where the pain is. I love finding the pain because pain is useful as a money grabbing tool. So I get, I act professionally. I will ask loads and loads of questions and I will be perfectly polite and courteous. I know roughly what that lease extension will cost. Let's say for the sake of argument, it's 20,000 pounds. 
And so very quickly, I will say, we haven't got a problem here. I can get the landlord solicitor to deal with this. We can get the paperwork sorted out tomorrow. If you instruct your solicitor, give them the funds, get in touch with the landlord solicitor. We can get the paperwork drawn up. We can get you that lease extension. Quickest I've ever done it is 24 hours, but that generally relies upon the leaseholder solicitor to have their act together. If you can just give us uh, £30,000, get it to your solicitor, we can sort it out tomorrow. We can complete the deal. You won't lose your dream house. The kids can go to that wonderful school down the road. Everything is wonderful. If they bite at that, then I've made £30,000 for my client rather than £20,000, which is the real price. My client would be very happy with that. So if I can get that commercial deal straight away, fine, I'll do it. If not, and generally leaseholders haven't got enough money for this sort of thing when they need it, then I will carry on talking to them. I will carry on being professional. We will talk to their solicitor. We will keep being proactive. And we will be busy, busy, busy achieving bugger all for as long as we can. The longest I've done it is a year. Why would I do that? Yes, you get more value as time goes on. From a freeholder point of view, remember that graph? As time goes on, the value of that lease goes up. The cost of getting that lease extension rises. So from a freeholder point of view, delay is good. But being professional, I need to be proactive, etc. So I need to be courteous, keep them on the string, keep them talking, keep them chugging along, but achieving bugger all. Conversely, if I'm acting for a leaseholder in this situation, my aim is completely different. I will, of course, be professional. I will be polite. I will know all the facts from my client. I will phone up the freeholder or the freeholder's agent. I know what that lease extension should cost. They know what that should cost. We have a very quick chat about the commerciality of it and can we do a deal. If we can do a deal, then again, I will want solicitors instructed straight away and I will want them to have the paperwork signed within about 14 days. Remember, the bugger on the other side is going to be doing what I do when I'm acting for a freeholder and he's going to be proactively doing not a lot. So I need to make sure that they do what they're meant to do as quickly as I want it done. So I normally give them about 14 days. If they don't do what we need, bang, I will serve a notice and we go down the legal route. So depending on what side of the fence I'm on, then I act differently. But remember, the important thing is that freeholders are up to something. Watch out for friendly freeholders. <laughs> They're always up to no good. Very polite, very sociable, really nice guy. He's only after the money. <laughs> so, going back to that notice. It comes from the Leasehold Reform Housing and Urban Development Act 1993, snappy name, as amended by the Common Hold and Leasehold Reform Act 2002. Equally snappy. Very boring. Um, it's section 42 of that act that gives leaseholders the right to have an extension of 90 years to the present term. So that 99-year lease from March 1990 would become 189 years from March 1990. It also allows for the ground rent to be reviewed to a peppercorn. Peppercorn is a legal term for zero. I don't know many landlords that collect peppercorns for ground rent. Um, it does remind me, though, of when I was managing a property not far from here, actually, in a Swiss cottage in the late 1980s, it would have been. And the leases there said that the ground rent was one dozen red roses to be delivered to a lady of the landlord's choice on the morning of 14th February. <laughs> Very romantic. We had to collect five dozen roses, and we had to deliver them to five different ladies none of which was his wife. 
Um, so read the leaves. It's amazing what you find in them sometimes. It really is. So that's what the Act says, and leaseholders are entitled to 90 years extension, provided they have owned the flat for two years. So if you are buying a short lease flat, you have a problem because you don't own it at all. And therefore, you can't serve a notice. So if you spot one of these in an auction or you found one of these, the way round the problem is to get your solicitor to draw up the Section 42 notice, which is a prescribed form. It's got to be 100% correct. Draw it up with the figures that you want, the information that you want, and you get the seller to serve it upon the landlord, satisfactorily serve it, and then assign the benefit to you. Now, you do that as a condition of exchange so that if they screw up the process, you can back out, you can get your deposit money back, and you can walk away. Don't be tempted to do the form yourself and serve it yourself because then if you screw it up, it's your own fault. Section 42, it is a prescribed form. You've got to get it 100% correct. The wording is prescribed. You can't change anything. No inaccuracies, no misdescriptions. And that's why I say use a specialist leasehold lawyer, because then if they screw it up, you can sue them. The important thing is that it fixes the valuation date. Now, remember when I said I was acting for a leaseholder, if I couldn't get a quick deal within 14 days for that leaseholder, if I didn't get the paperwork signed by the landlord, I would then serve a notice. The reason for that is that it fixes the valuation date. You can carry on negotiating after that for three, four months, but all the calculations will be done at the date you served that notice. So the value from the freeholder point of view stops going up and from the leaseholder point of view, stops going down. Okay? It's, it fixes everything. And that sometimes makes uh, freeholders think a little bit more about it, because there's no point in dragging it on. It isn't going to get any better for the freeholder. It also triggers a series of things that the, lease, that the leaseholder and the freeholder must do. And at the end of that process, if you can't reach agreement within six months, then you can apply to the tribunal, the first tier tribunal, and have them decide what the figure should be for you. Costs are involved. The law says that you are responsible as the leaseholder, obviously for your own costs, but you're also responsible for the freeholders' reasonable costs. Now, reasonable costs is a lawyer word that makes lawyers' money, because what I think is reasonable, what you think is reasonable, and you think is reasonable are all different things. Tribunals are used to what is reasonable, because there's case law about that. Um, it obviously depends on the circumstances, but generally in a sort of bog standard case where there's nothing complicated, you're looking at sort of two and a half thousand pounds for your costs, two and a half thousand pounds for the landlord's costs. So, you know, figure that into your equations when you're costing out these things, about 5,000. If you've got a complicated situation or special circumstances, it may well be more, particularly on the valuation side. Specialists, two very good websites for you. The Association of Leasehold and Franchisement Practitioners has a directory of lawyers, valuers, specialists in this area. What you want is a valuer who is close to the property and knows the area and the values near the property. And generally, you want a lawyer who is near to you because you're going to have to sign a few things. Also, the Leasehold Advisory Service, which is a government paid for but independent body. Um, they've got, actually, it's a very good website. But get that exactly right, lease-advice.org. There is one very similar one on the internet that charges you for everything. This one is free um, and is a very good site for anything leasehold. It also has a calculator on there so that you can get a rough idea of what your 
lease extension premium should be. It's not going to be to the penny, but it will tell you whether it's going to be 10,000 or 100,000, whatever. It gives you a ballpark figure. Very good websites. They've also got a directory of specialists as well all over the country. Do you qualify? As I mentioned before, you need to have owned that flat for two years in order to serve the notice. Now, Lynn and I had one um, down in Bournemouth where we were at a, a meeting similar to this, where somebody came up to me afterwards. He was um, an investor who was based in Buckinghamshire. He had this one flat down in Bournemouth out of his area. He wanted to sell it. It had 82 years left unexpired. Um, he wanted to sell it for 65,000, which was cheap. I agreed to buy it. We shook hands. He gave me the keys straight away. We had a tenant in by the weekend, even though it wasn't our flat. Um, we then went on through the process. Next day, I did a search on that, and I found out that he had only owned that flat for 18 months not two years, as he had said. So we exchanged on that, but had a delayed completion until he had owned that flat for two years and a day, and then he served the notice we had given him, and then he assigned the benefit to us. We carried on, completed the purchase and the lease extension, and got the mortgage on the extended lease. If you're a buyer, Remember that, that you do the notice yourself, but you give it to the seller to serve on the freeholder as a condition of your exchange. Marriage value. There's a complicated uh, process calculations in the valuation uh, to do with the leaseholder's interest and the value of the leaseholder's interest before and after the lease extension and the freeholders before and after that, and it sort of looks at the two of those and the compensation that's appropriate. The important thing to note is that if you have got more than 80 years unexpired, marriage value is ignored. So in effect, you get a cheap lease extension. That's why I said when you go home tonight and read your bloody lease, if you have got 80 something years, do something about it now, because now you can get a relatively cheap lease extension. If it gets down to 79 years, 364 days, the price goes up. So do go and read your bloody lease. If not tonight, then tomorrow morning. It's important, it will save you money. So, how is the value put together, how does a landlord come up with the value of a lease extension or the tribunal if it gets to that, that point? Well, firstly, you are compensating the landlord, the freeholder, for the loss of income. Remember that the Act says that the rent will go down to a peppercorn, so they're not getting their 50 quid a year or whatever, and therefore you have to compensate for that. And also, because you're giving them an extension for 90 years, they're not going to get that flat back for the next 90 years after the end of the term, so you need to compensate them for that loss of income as well. So that's part of it. The values obviously change on that graph. Depending upon how much time is unexpired, the value on the leaseholder side, the value on the freeholder side changes and the marriage value deals with that in a very complicated valuation way, and the legislation says that 50% of that is paid by the leaseholder to the freeholder. So if you can avoid marriage value, it will save you money. And in flats around here, that's a lot of money. You've also got to compensate the landlord because obviously he's not going to get his hands on that flat for an additional 90 years that possession he was going to get at the end of 99 years is now going to be 189 years away. So it's not going to be his grandchildren, it's going to be his great-great-grandchildren or whatever. It affects the value of that freehold today and therefore you have to compensate the landlord for that. But 
you can not go the legal route. You can do what I do on behalf of leaseholders immediately and what I do for freeholders immediately, and that's go for a commercial deal. Negotiate what is a good price for both of you. See what you can do. In this particular situation, you, as a leaseholder, may well be happy to pay some ground rent rather than have no ground rent. If it's 250, 300 pounds a year, that's not gonna break the bank. But if you can knock off three, 4,000 pounds from the cost of the lease extension, that will be worth doing. So you can negotiate with the freeholder to pay some ground rent and pay less money for the extension. You may not need an additional 90 years. Most of us don't need 189 years from whenever. What we're worried about is the mortgageability. So you may want to say to the freeholder, well, let me have a shorter extension, perhaps up to 125 years, because that's perfectly okay for what I need. So pay less for a shorter extension. Or a combination of the two. Freeholders are business people, they are open to negotiation, and depending upon who they are, you may well be able to get a nice deal that suits you. If you have a big institutional type freeholder, like Freshwater that I mentioned earlier, then the chances are they will go for every hurdle they can put in the way, they will go for every penny they can get, because that's what they do. On the other hand, if you've got a freeholder who's Mrs. Jones, who just happens to have these flats, she inherited them from her husband or something like that, if you get to her on the right day, she may well want 10 grand to go and buy a new car or a handbag or whatever. So depending on who the freeholder is, you may well be able to get a good deal on the right day. The timetable for all this, as I mentioned, when you serve that section 42 notice, it starts a timetable. The landlord has to respond, and generally what the landlord does is serve a, a counter notice which states the price you've offered is too low, I want this higher price. Nine out of ten, I like that. They may say that there's an error in the form or something like that. The, you don't qualify, whatever it might be. They have to serve that counter notice. If they don't serve the counter notice, then you carry on and you get your extension from the price that you put in your notice. Any freeholder worth his salt, if he's breathing, will respond. They don't have to do any scientific work behind it. They just serve the counter notice asking for more money. What I do is normally just double whatever they offered and send it back. Quite often that will frighten people away. Quite often when I get somebody phone me up and they say I've been told by the estate agent it's 10,000 pounds, I say the estate agent's wrong, it's 20. I never hear from them again. Estate agents always seem to say 10,000. I don't know why they say 10,000, it's a nice number. Maybe it's in a estate agent training school, I don't know. <laughs> but never believe it, but whatever a leaseholder says to me, I will instantly double it and, and throw it back. And most of the time they go away. But in all of this, the most important thing to remember is, you know, you know the answer to this, it is read, the, read bloody the bloody lease. I can't emphasize that enough. Anyone who's got a leasehold flat, it is the rule book for your flat, for your block. It's the rule book for how the landlord charges you money, service charges, etc. It's the rule book for what you can do in that flat or not do in that flat. You know, you can't have wild parties unless you invite Ranjan or whatever. You can't knock a hole in the wall unless you get permission from the landlord. You can't do a loft extension if your flat stops at the ceiling. It's important. Now, they are complicated things. You read them, you fall asleep, but when you wake up, you know, read a bit more. <laughs> and the more you do it, the more you do it, the easier it becomes to spot the bits that you need. You know, 90, 99, you can all recognize 99 years or 125 years from. That's an important bit. You can recognize the money bit. 
50 pounds, 100 pounds, whatever it is. That gives you a start. Just skim through. Don't worry about the legal gobbledygook. Just go for those bits that you can recognize. And then you can follow up with further detail if you need it. So, if you need more information, Google Bernie Wales short leases. It will take you there. Or go to my website. There is a short leases uh, page.